and we are live as promised returning champion Maureen Blanford. How you doing? So happy to be here. We overcame many pre-flight challenges. So I'm feeling good about this. Those feeling were a lot of this. pre-flight challenges. And uh, for those of you in, already in the chat, we're counting on your thoughtful and occasionally snarky commentary to keep us on track. So hopefully you are here I'm trying to do my best to overcome LinkedIn's weirdness, but we're not going to talk about that because we're going to stay focused on digital transformation, what goes wrong. Marines plan some really good stuff that is like never before seen stuff, which is cool. It's true. Yeah, we're gonna, she's going to do some countdowns for us of some things that uh, perhaps we've overlooked. Um, you know, here's a good way to get yourself onto my show for a repeat visit. Get in an argument with me at a party. It wasn't an argument. No, it was great, though, because you came in with a head of steam around a lot of stuff that we both care a lot about around, you know, it, we were talking a lot about generative AI, but it wasn't just that. It was this whole thing around bias in our industry and confronting it. Of course, as a female founder, you don't know anything about that. So, <laughs> but you're able to empathize. So, oh God. I thought we were just having a fun conversation. And then you told me a couple of days later, I came in hot. Um, no, it was good, did. though. It was good, though. It was, uh, hi, Tracy. Really glad you're here. Hey, Tracy. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was good, though. It was the kind of thing that I really love to have at parties, which is a conversation of substance yes. to people who have really strong viewpoints. And, you know, that's perfect for my show is people who really care about this industry, who have done their homework. I think you check those boxes. So what so what we're going to do during the show is we're going to do so we're going to do the usual countdown format of what goes wrong with digital transformations, things that we haven't really thought about as much as Marine thinks we should. <laughs> and then we are going to go into what to do about it, which uh, is also going to surface some material that that Marine really hasn't revealed in this format before. So this is cool. It's going to be fun. But before we do that, I do want to bring users up to date on a couple things because you've been really, really pressing on trying to solve data related problems, even before this AI thing kind of brought this like to the fore, right? In a lot of good and bad ways. But then you also had a big thing happen to you because in in January, you got uh, named officially to this. Uh, it's a it's a tech innovation lab in the UK. Can you, can you tell us about that? Because that was a pretty big deal. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, yeah, it took a long time too. So the UK it has a program uh, called the Global Entrepreneur Program where they are working to bring foreign founders over um, and have us build our businesses from here and, and scale globally. Uh, and so as part of that program, I got a UK Tech Innovator visa. And thanks, Elizabeth Varley, for working with me on that. Um, she's terrific and the program is terrific. So I'm delighted to be based in the UK, growing from here. So how do you fulfill the honor that you were presented with? What, what do you do now to, to live up to what you've been given? What do you have to do? So largely, it is um, it is utilizing resources that the government is providing. So there's a lot of advisory, so participating in that. And there's a commitment to um, having a percentage of the team be UK based, which fair enough, um, that's a that's an easy percentage. Um, and then uh, really it sounds cheesy, but, and, and there's no formal quota for this, but just giving back. So as you learn sharing with others, uh, so the GEP uh, folks that have come before us have been really generous with their time coming back and saying, here are the challenges that we had um, and how we would overcome them, which for me, is such a breath of fresh air versus a lot of the tech programs you can go to that are interviewing some guy who was successful 10 years ago and a lot of like, rah, rah, here's how, it, and none of it's relevant to early stage founders. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of the program. Cool. Well, you got some fans here. Marshall is excited to see your latest. So this is gonna be cool. Um, and I do want to get into start getting into this shortly on this transformation topic. But before we do that, I just I, I want to spend a, a moment or two just just in in your evolution of your thinking because it strikes me that that you've become sort of clear that our industry needs to fundamentally change in some ways. And I get the sense that you that that's a pretty hard one insight because you've been 
working at this for a while as, as I have is also. And, and it seems like you, you have developed a bit of a theory about this that incorporates both how we handle data which is mostly poorly, <laughs> but, you know, but, but also just the people side of this industry and people who follow you on LinkedIn may occasionally see you vent on this topic. And we may get to that later in the program as far as, especially on the industry event circuit, just what a sort of, sort of pathetic display of pseudo diversity and inclusion that we see at, at a lot of shows and stuff. But, but I think it goes deeper than just that, right? It's, there's, there's the sense that you've arrived at that we need to fundamentally change, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I've had um, the, it's it's a coincidence probably having been on a client side and um, on the agency side, but having been in these companies um, that are really struggling. Um, and then, you know, when you're on the agency side, you can kind of see across the, the board more. But my, con- my context is really B2Bs, um, complex sale. I don't know the, the B2C side. I'm sure there's some crossover. Um, but I do think we have to acknowledge that selling Hershey bars and selling data warehouses are two different things, even though people are buying them. Well, um, I almost have to do one like of the things I must have to do like an applause for that only because I hear so much of this. <laughs> I, I hear so much of this B2B and B2B, B2C are the same bullshit. Um, and, and I understand some of the arguments behind it. And we, we could talk about that maybe if people want to. I've written on this, Digenomica, but thank you for clarifying that because there, there's a massive difference and it affects a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. I mean, one of my favorite things to say is Kate Middleton has had children. She has knees. I have children. I also have knees. Kate Middleton and I are the same. You know, I mean, it's that's the kind of logic around it. But anyway, I think that's good context for me is the B2B part. And then the other part that really riles me up, and I have Dory Clark to thank for this. Um, so if any of you know her, um, if you don't, she's she's a great one to look up. But she surfaces a couple of HBR studies. Um, and, and these numbers are so identical, but, but two points in two different studies. One is that senior leaders believe that the most value that they have to offer to their organization is their strategic thinking. You know, like 97% of them, they think that's the biggest value. I think closer to 100% are reporting that they don't have any time for strategic thinking. And it's because we're buried in all of this shite um, that is, um, we're just cobbling all day long. So I think that's really important. And then the last piece for me, um, and now I've gone way astray, is that I'm focused on, on go-to-market data. So product marketing, sales, and success, and anyone else who's, who's involved in, in that kind of data, um, that's my focus. And we, we just have that. If you've been internal at a company recently, and then folks like the Diginomica team, like you guys are magic because you get this, haven't being internal, you know, at, I, have, I have no idea how you do it. But if you've been internal you know how much of your time is spent just cobbling stuff together. And then there's a deadline and you just throw that over the wall, not sure if it's right or not, but you've done your level best with the tools you have. So yeah, a hundred percent, we need a new way of doing things. Right. And you've written some pretty cool stuff on your serendipitous website. I'm going to paste in one link to the chat for folks. Uh, You may not see this on all platforms, but you've done a really good job of kind of quantifying the costs of, of what cobbling data is all about both. And, and the material cost of that is pretty shocking to the financial cost. But of course, to your point, also the human cost of, of what's lost when we're spending that time doing that. So I think that's the final piece of the puzzle for, for me in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, which is while you, you have this uh, voice that appeals to me because you have a pretty – radical view of wanting to fundamentally change. You also are really trying to help people who are under resourced arrest and, and you're not trying to paint this world of let's do this under abundance of resources and time and funding. You're trying to help companies that, that are tight in all those areas, but still want to change for the better. Is that a pretty good summary? That's absolutely it. And I don't know if we can name names, so I won't right now. Um, Maybe I'll just wink. Um, I'm not going to wink, um, but the biggest companies in the world um, are doing the same thing. They're for monthly reporting. They're pulling data out of their own systems 
um, that they're selling a vision to their customers being data driven. They're pulling data out of their own systems, manipulating it in Excel and Google Sheets. 30 people, 50 tabs, someone breaks it. Monthly report tomorrow, you have to present anyway. And one of the other things I like for people to know is everyone is, is so ashamed of their own data and thinks everybody else is in a, is in a better place. No one's in a better place. Mm. Right. And of course, the implications are that if if that's the case, then your AI is going to suck too. Like your AI is not going to fix that. So a hundred percent. Which which we could spend a little more time on before we're all said and done here. And I also want to make sure, just as a marker, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I should tell the audience here that I don't know exactly what Marine's going to say. So this is, I wanted to be surprised. So, but but one thing I do want to make sure we cover at some point is is small data because that's a really important point of emphasis for you. So let's make sure we do that. So with that in mind, we are going to start. And and by the way, um, if you are watching, please you know don't hesitate to post your commentary on this because I'd like to work it into what we're doing. We're going to do a bit of a countdown on ways digital transformation goes wrong, and and these are ways that you find that particularly important that maybe we aren't paying attention to. Is that the best way to think about this? Yep. Okay, let's start with one of them. Okay, and I'm just saying John is forcing me to do this old school, but so... Yeah, here we go. Um, All right. It, okay, we're there. All right. So top reason is we're focused on secondary reasons um, for why. So when you read about why digital tra transformations fail or why companies are stalled, um, there's nothing wrong with the reasons that the top thinkers are saying. Um, usually those are coming from consultants or analysts Nothing wrong with that. Um, but so it could be um, the, the CIO needs to be aligned to the strategic biz business objectives. It could be cloud is good, cloud is bad. It could be whatever. Um, but that is that is a secondary reason. And if we don't, thanks, Josh. Yeah, you're right. Josh, Josh and I have talked about this too. But these are secondary reasons we're talking about, which is another reason why we can't solve for transformation is because we don't have we don't have the right focus up front. Right. So Josh is chiming in here for our audio listeners after the fact. This is all a great setup for the AI suck problem. Bad data is everywhere. Indeed. And and, and Josh, I think we're going to find, I think we're going to hit a little bit of a wall uh, with generative AI in the next like six to 12 months and I th as it plays out in the enterprise. And I think one of the reasons is going to be the discovery of of these data quality problems and, and the other is going to be the limitation of the technology. But if you want to read more about that, I just wrote a piece on that. Generative AI is the new UI or not. So you can check that out on Diginomica. Um, Timo, welcome to the chat. Doesn't it always come down to bad incentives? I think I think that's a big part of it. Um, and bad incentives or incentives that aren't even acknowledged for the business users along the way. I think we focus too much on what's going on from the the IT roadmap for for transformation, and we forget about which was is my second. Thank you, um, my second um, countdown piece. So I'll address sort of what I think we should do about this. Are are we ready for the second one? Uh, yeah, let's let's have another. What do you got? Number two, comms. comms. So if any of you have had the joy of sitting in um, trans transformation sessions. And boy, please let me just say the internal team that's trying to drive this as well as the external partner, like really hardworking, very smart people, not necessarily comms people. So internal communication tends to be around like the architecture big rocks or like the IT big rocks. Um, that's the big, big note at the kickoff and throughout the process. And rarely is it about what the business leaders should be expecting um, and what they need to understand to get the data that they need. And since we don't have that, there are no real incentives for them to work around this bananas project that they've been handed. Does that resonate? Indeed. And I was just looking up one piece because Neil has joined the chat, Neil Raynan, Diginomica contributor. It's complaining about the weather in Santa Fe. I'm sure everyone on this call is enjoying perfectly fabulous weather, so we don't even need to go there. 
Uh, but but Neil actually wrote a piece on Digonomica that factors into the show today because you were reading into kind of uh, he had, he wrote about uh, want to get digital transformation right address what's left behind do a search mm-hmm. for Neil on Digonomica anyway this kind of fit into our theme of under recognized keys to digital transformation which is why we're here. Yeah, and I must say that Neil has also done some excellent work on silos as well. Just, just terrific. Um. Ryan, <laughs> data so, quality so- problems. You're not talking about all my fake profiles on social media, are you? Well, it, it does raise an interesting question, right? Because now, you know, there, there's a lot of important information, even in the B two B side, customer information in unstructured profiles that are definitely a mixture of vetted and not very vetted information that, that create more problems, right? Because you're trying to get a handle on data and suddenly to really understand things like sentiment, demand, you have to navigate these channels and try to make sense out of this bullshit. And people like Brian are creating fake profiles. And and also apparently the president of Stanford is creating fake <laughs> articles yeah. with data manipulation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's going to have plenty of time to create more articles because he's moving on from that gig. Do a search on that also. Yeah. Yes. Rip from the headlines. We are, we are current. We are current, Maureen. Uh, current. Tracy says comms and strategy and vision should be in place before they ever buy software. They're often letting vendors, sales teams tell them what they need. Please stop that in all caps. Okay. Maybe, maybe this will actually happen in our Barbie world where we do everything correctly from that perspective up front, where all good things happen. So Timo agrees 100% with the communication problem. He's a little biased, but he thinks every IT organization needs an evangelism function, someone who enjoys talking to people more than doing tech. What do you think of that? So I agree. Um, And as a change agent uh, at a couple of different organizations doing this work, you get like about 12 good months of that. And then people get a little tired of the cheerleading. Um, I, and, and I, who, it, Dion talks about this quite a bit. We need a lot more change agents in organizations, not just for now, but just for ongoing because evolution isn't ever going to stop. Um, and, and you'll just, anyway, we'll leave it there. Evolution won't stop. But, but comms is, is huge. Um, number three. All right, here we I go. I don't do this very well. We have a 20th yeah, no, century data hangover. Um, we have too much data. I've written about this. I think I have a recent piece called Too Much Data. Um, we have too much data, particularly on the B2B side. Uh, there is so much go-to-market data that we do not need. Um, and it creates the giant data lakes that are, are a mess. Nothing's architected the same. So we're, we're spending boatloads of company resource cleansing that. Not enough admin support for the head of sales and the head of marketing and product and success for those people to be making sense of their terrible spreadsheet numbers that are getting pulled from somewhere. Um, and at some point we need to let go and we can talk about small data in a bit. And, and I'm still a fan of large data, um, but I'm a bigger fan, I'll talk about later, of, of getting more muscle memory built into the cross-functional teams to be architecting outcomes up front. Um, so we're not doing as much cobbling downstream. Brian says you won't optimize the data for AI all until we get rid of whiteboards, post-its, paper, and spreadsheets. He keeps seeing all of these. Every client can get an AI for post-its app. You know, it's interesting. I was just listening to a podcast with Gary Marcus on why IBM Watson failed. And one of the fascinating reasons for that is, is that so much of the important doctor information was handwritten um, and unstructured contextual information on patients that Watson didn't have access to. It's not the only reason that the medical, I'm talking about the medical play, not what IBM's rebranded now. But anyway, I just thought it was a fascinating example of what we're dealing with here, where some of the most important data doesn't live in friendly RDB, RDBMS format, if you will. Catherine, welcome. In a large scale program I worked on, I facilitated a group of 300 company leaders representing all functions. And geos, they were the network of leaders that, that brought the business perspective to the organization. That actually sounds like somewhat of a healthy, that might be too healthy for our discussion. That actually sounds proper. proper Is that project. something you've written about and can share with others? 
Yeah, we'd like to document that a little further. And by the way, Catherine, a little bit further into the program, we'll probably shift gears a little more towards solutions. The general structure of, of my show is outline the problems and also have a little bit of a spleen vent on the shit that's driving us nuts and getting in our way. And then we start shifting gears towards what we're going to do about it. So, um, so Josh says we have tech debt, process debt, data debt, people debt. We're a debtor industry for sure. Indeed. Yep. Pile on Josh. I mean, let's not, let's not talk about solutions till we understand the scope of the swamp that we're in. Right. Yeah. Suki. Welcome. Suki. She thinks that Suki thinks it's a little optimistic back to Timo's comment that the company's going to, something positive is we have many people out here evangelizing for things that are, that are bad. Well, certainly we see that. Certainly we see that in the case of a lot of techno evangelism, right? And that's the, the, the evangelist job description is often abused. No, no offense implied to Timo or anyone else who has that in the chat currently, but unfortunately some companies, I don't think are using it in the right way. Right. We, I, I would argue we need people evangelists more than we need tech evangelists within Within companies. No, I'm not talking about software vendors, but. Yeah. Catherine so, says she's going to document some of this for us. That would be very cool, Catherine. We look, look forward to hearing more of that after this event. That would be very cool. Thank you. And Maureen. Okay, my my number four, I had a hard time deciding, but so I, I did both. Whoops. Um, and I'm going to go with the cotton candy on puppies because I think we'll be talking about AI. Could you read that? Yeah, yeah. Cotton you can say it out puppies. loud, too. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many of you have been in these actual meetings where you've got, you know, the IT team, you've got the vendor partner, um, love that Tracy. And then you've got the business owner users and we're, we're trying to, um, go through the roadmap and, and what's happening. And the cotton candy on puppies thing is my, is my universal, um, frame for what happens to derail these programs. So, um, so, so let's say that I'm, I hate role playing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so let's say I'm a GM, a CEO, an EVP, an MD, whatever. And the team is presenting to us. And I say, guys, this is great. You're fabulous. This is terrific. Love what you're doing. But so for the partner ecosystem, we still need to be putting cotton candy on puppies because if we don't, they're going to lose their minds. And that's really a big number for us. And so it's important that that piece stays. Everything else I'm on board with, but, you know, so then the director of IT, who's like four or five levels down from this person, valiantly tries to explain that there's actually good stuff coming here. And we understand we've taken that into concern. And the MD exec is like, Got it. We cannot change it. I've got a big number here. Cotton candy on puppies. Partner might explain. So then what happens in this actual meeting is the director of IT shrinks and is like, okay, cotton candy on puppies. And then you times that by a gazillion times across the scope of the project. And I think this is the most untalked about unseen thing that derails progress, whether you call it digital transformation, whether you call it data health, whatever, is you have people hanging on to their thing because we haven't communicated appropriately. We haven't incentivized them. We haven't helped them understand how there might be some data loss somewhere, which is okay in B2B, um, because we don't need as much data in B2B as we do in B2C. Um, but all of these things haven't been communicated up front. So the person with the target understandably freaks out and wants to hang on to this rickety thing um, because of the partner ecosystem or whatever. Uh, but that is a huge thing that derails these programs. Tracy, this client advocate as a service is, is a cool line and it's also interesting to think about what that would look like in practice. Feel free to uh, flesh that out a little further. And I just wanted to comment on this for a moment because I, I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by how this plays out a lot of times inside of, inside of companies because I, I, just, I just think there needs to be a, a different understanding. Like I was invited to this LinkedIn thread on why do people fear change? I was invited as like a thought leader to, co to comment on this post. And, I, and, and one thing that I said was like, People, this like this is cliche that people fear change. It's like if you they fear change when they're when they feel like their jobs are gonna get 
lost in a headcount reduction that they don't understand. They fear change when they wonder how technology is going to impact what they do. They feel they fear change when they have no ownership over what's happening around them. They they fear change when they're when they're being driven down in their negotiations around their well being and their remote work when they want to take care of their aging relatives, but they're afraid to do that because other people are in the office around the water cooler playing politics and and they feel like they're being leveraged by AI and technology. That's why they fear change. It's such, oh my God, it's just ridiculous. Anyway, sorry, I just had that. No, I think I think that. that's huge. And I don't think we talk about that side enough um, because the other thing from the very top that people aren't given is whether you like this phrase or not, psychological safety. So if you have a huge number that you're supposed to deliver and someone's pulling the rug out from under you, that's a shitty position to be in. And you shouldn't be in that position. Part of, part of evolution should allow for, you know, Tiger Woods retooling his swing and there's going to be like a little bit of a dip back. I'm sure that's an old, I don't know what a current, you know, but retooling our swings mean we're going to take a dip before we go back up. Right. And that's exactly. not something that's discussed. Exactly. I, I, I just I just believe that that's a little bit overrated, the fear of change. I think if you do things right, people will get on board with some of the yes. change. I think people understand the concept of, of changing their lives for the better if they're included in the process. But anyway, we can talk more about that. Uh, there's a side topic going on in evangelism. We're not going to cover all of that in our discussion here. But Josh says evangelism is about spreading the gospel. Most companies have a pretty orthodox one way view of what that gospel is and how it's communicated more cotton candy. Anyway, so Timo and Josh are having some back and forth on that. Josh says not every evangelist can be a Timo. Unfortunately, that is a hard truth. Brian says transformation trap actually heard. We want to be innovative, but we don't want to be the first firm to do this. Wow, Brian, you you definitely got Marine on that one. She's I mean, seen that's, that one that's a little bit too real, isn't it, Brian? I, I, that's just, yes. Tracy says, I offered it as an offering and clients don't seem to see that they need this. Maybe because, maybe because large SIs have assured them they are fine. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And this is one of the main talking points of my show. So I'm not going to derail our show with this whole thing around the need for independent voices and independent experts on projects, but I think it's fundamentally important. Do you have something else for us? I have a number five for here. And this is my, if you know me, this is my way. I wish I could get that right, but it's hard. Um, yeah. Silos, 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 silos. We have reams of insights in our organizations today um, that we can't get our hands on because of silos. Uh, and I think the market does a good job talking about breaking down silos from the tech perspective, and I think we do a good job talking about it from the human perspective, so analysts, consultants, community managers, but you can't unsilo the tech without unsiloing the humans and having those conversations. So, um, huge, my area, obviously, but huge. I like that. Neil says, the yawning gap in every playbook, framework, or methodology for digital transformation I've ever seen is near need for more rigor about the fear of leaving behind. Promoting the benefits is insufficient. And Neil's written a whole post on that. I'll, I'll get that URL out a little bit later on, but you can also find that on our site. It was a really good article. So those are my top five, what we're, what we're missing. Um, Brian, I don't think that website actually exists, but good thought. Pull out the rug from under you.com. The one tech knows same Great user idea. would recommend their firm buy. And, and kind of shifting gears as we start to shift a little more towards what we're going to do about all this, Josh says, fearing change that is imposed on someone as opposed to change that one is involved with and part of is what really mucks things up. Getting stakeholders involved and having ownership can work. So um, I would urge those in the chat as we start to shift gears a little bit, start thinking about projects that actually did work so we can maybe identify a few things that will keep us successful. Because after all, we don't get paid to gripe. We get paid to solve problems. Griping is just for fun. That's why this show doesn't have a sponsor and it's completely unfiltered. <laughs> uh, Timo, uh, any project that merits the term digital transformation crosses existing silos, but but people cling to them. And, and Maureen does have a post. You got a really good post on your site about this. And it is called The Great Unsiloing. I recommend it. So 
I also have a very short book um, that I'm happy to include in the show notes as well called Moats and Drawbridges that talks about how we got to the siloed place, what it's costing us, and the path out. Um, and I, I think that's the path off Legacy Mountain. Right, Legacy Mountain. Now that's that gets back to the last time you were on. So if, you, if a, folks, yeah. if folks, folks want to see some more on Legacy Mountain, we we got into that pretty deep last time. But you kind of perceive that as as everything that's standing in the way of what we need to accomplish, right? Yeah, it's legacy. It's legacy infrastructure, mindsets, processes. Um, it's it's all our stuff. Uh, it's all legacy, and it, it keeps us really stuck. Uh, and not moving forward, like there's it, it, all of the things that folks are saying um, are absolutely true. The entire organization so stuck, like they just can't see their way past it. You know, it's hard. Catherine says one problem is that the sustained enablement for the humans needs to extend beyond the tech implementation period. That's yes. one reason yes. that chain success is limited. Catherine, that's a really good one, and it's something that. Josh Greenbaum was in the chat and myself have talked a lot about, which is I call it the buzzword boomerang effect, but it's encouraging customers to appropriate vendor buzzwords and redefine them for themselves. And customer success is pretty high on my list of those. And I think I, I really think customers need to challenge vendors and service providers and SIs around what customer success means and redefine it around what they care about and then hold their providers to account. And, and obviously we, we, one of the best things about that term is that it goes beyond a project. You know, I mean, that's one of the things I'm actually slightly optimistic about in our industry is that there's a lot less of this that used to be in, in the early days, like pre Y2K and stuff. It was all handshakes and smiles and took you live. And then we headed out to the next high fives, big party. And then talk about hangover, right? The, the hangover of like, oh my God, this technology is still crap. We're still not achieving business outcomes, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I think we need to redefine customer success, but that's probably a whole different conversation. Uh, Josh says the great unsiling was transcribed as the great unsmiling. But again, I think that's a great way to look at it. Nice. Okay. I guess I need to look at that. Politically, the silo leaders, says Tracy, are the ruler of their turf and it gets crazy. The data that is actually powerful spans silos. Well, that, I think that's starting to set up the next part of our conversation. Nice job, Tracy. It, it, it is. And the, the, the cool thing, I'm just going to say this really briefly. The cool thing is once people start to see the light about silos, even if you have a colleague, because in every project I work on, I hear something like this. Oh, our head of success is never going to, they're not, no. head of sales, they're not, head of product won't. So it's always somebody, it's a personality type. But once you do one or two sort of cross-functional projects, they start to come on board. And that's the kind of the work I think we, we need to be seeing. But anyway, um, so should I should I go to my... Yeah, I just want to say that Tracy says, uh, oh my God, the go live does not deserve cake. It is not the end. Yes, come on, Tracy, sure. the cake is good, man. It no. tastes good. Oh man, but it does have a kick, doesn't it? Does there's a little bit of indigestion after the go live yeah. party, yeah. unfortunately. So so yeah, I do want to switch gears now and 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 this next list. How would you define it? This is kind of what we're going to do about it. Is this yeah. Basically? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know is, that I. Go and ahead. this is a sneak preview of a presentation that could eventually appear at an event near you. So this this could be cool. Okay. New material new material so that I still can't quit. So, so for me, the top thing is get comms right. Um, so expectation setting, rinse, repeat, um, focus on the outcomes. We really do need to treat the business users as though they're the customers and think about selling to them. So anticipating objections, understanding what's going to keep them involved as they go along, because those are the people who are going to derail this project. And three years from now, Diginomic is going to be writing about you and why, why your transformation failed. But if you can think upstream about that and make sure that all of your communications to the folks outside of the transformation team need to start with the data that they need and when they'll see it. Uh, how it might be different from what they have today. Those are the milestones those people want to care about, those, that they'll care about, and then put your milestones underneath that. But start with the outcomes they care about. Mm. 
you might also remind them how bad it currently is, their, their current data. Yeah, and uh, is, is small data on your upcoming list or can we talk about that now? Let's talk about it now. Okay, because so, because I really want to get into that a little bit because only because big data is is basically an obsession right now because the, these AI models, most, there, there's some hope that there can be transitions to other types of models, but right now the, the models that have gotten all the headlines for good and bad reasons are dependent on massive data sets. And so the obsession is with size and scale and I get that, but but you've spent a lot of time on small data. What, what does that phrase mean to you and why is it important on these projects? So the, I can nod to people who came before me like Trisha. Trisha Wang. Yeah. Um, who's been talking about small data for 10 years and, and she's amazing. Um, and, and certainly what we're, we're working on building is small data that you have access to quickly that's corroborated and, and collaborated. So my number two, which we can skip for now, is that we don't need all this data that we have, especially in B2B. Um, so the couple of transformations I've led or led the business side or whatever, the first one I accidentally was leading um, and accidentally discovered that when you talk about um, transitioning data, people flip out. Um, I meant to say that more kindly, people flip out. Um, so one of the things I discovered early on was, you know, people want like eight to 10 years of CRM data when they don't need that in B2B and the world has changed or whatever. So, okay, fine, we'll, we'll keep two years, anyone can do what they want, we'll keep two years in our new system the other years, we'll keep over here in this box. I promise you, I'll do nothing with it. It's there. It's accessible. And when you want it, you can go get it. And guess what? In three months, everyone forgot about the box. No one needed that data. However, if we're working with all of that data, then we're cleansing and cleansing and cleansing. Um, and, and by the time it's cleansed, is it any good? It's old. You know, who cares? So for me, small data um, are, are not just smaller data sets. Um, but it's smaller data sets where you've worked harder on architecting sort of the solution that you need today. And you can start to build on that. Um, and then when you have six or 12 months of data, you've got a smaller data set that is not only less data, but it is, um, um, it, for me, it's, it's, you know, the thing that happens with your CRM, where just over time you add, 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 add fields and ugh. So with a smaller data mindset, you can keep all of that to a minimum. So you're working with data that you care about that's fresh and that you can believe in. I don't know if that's a good definition or not, but it's what I like. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. So as, as you all are posting in the chat, start thinking on, please, some of your more successful projects. I realize that success is is sort of a work in progress for most companies, especially large scale transformations. But if you've seen tactics that you think achieve better results, let's let's see them. Josh says, uh, the number two reasons project fail after change management is related to data migration and governments. Small data is a great way to think about mitigating a problem. Yeah. And and, and also write this this notion that, you know, we, we don't have any more of these windows of one to two or three year buy-in on projects. You have to be able to come to the business leadership every quarter at least and be able to answer to like, you know, what results were achieved along this path, right? And so the smaller data, I think, lends itself well to that, right? Because you can always expand from there, but you, at least you can show a track record around a particular area where you're improving processes. So what's next on your list, Maureen? Great. Um, okay, so, um, oh, I actually did a cute thing there. So I said we don't need all that data. Um, but number three is, you would think I'd be better at this by now. Uh, the, your organization needs a path to insights, a fast path, and a trustworthy path to insights. And I think we'd all be hard pressed to ask anyone at a normal organization today if they're happy with the insights that they have at their fingertips, if they trust them, if they're turning that around quickly. Um, more often than not, um, uh, so I had a colleague just recently tell me that if, if she uncovered new data um, in her region, uh, um, so she's exec level in a, in a geo that's not the US, um, it would take headquarters six to nine months to act on that information. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of 
bad things going on um, with data. It's, it's hard to come by. It's hard to get. But also, if someone uncovers it, the systems, the legacy systems, processes, mindsets in place, you know, people have their path. They know what their H2 plan is. So even if you've got some really trustworthy data you're going to give to me, we got our plan. That's an interesting example you gave, too, because in that case, an insight was identified, but the process was still broken. So there was an insight, but it wasn't acted on. So an unacted upon insight is like an uninsight, maybe like a, it's gone. And within the same functional area too. So yeah. uh, functional area in Europe um, and the same functional area in the U S and, and headquartered in the U S this is actually really common um, U S based technology companies um, working with geos around the world. They, they can be very challenging. So part of your methodology here, then you, you're, you're wanting to m minimize some of the sort of time spent plumbing and admin around this stuff and, and emphasize more the what to do about it, which is where the insights come in. Can you talk a little bit more about like how you develop that? Like, so for example, I've, I find that dashboards are kind of a divisive topic in terms of people who, or even customers, some customers who swear by them and some who are kind of indifferent. Like, what is your view in terms of, is insights just a matter of giving executives more time with the data or do we need to kind of help serve up information as well? Like what, what is your take on that? Um, boy, Marshall had a great uh, quote on, on insights that I've actually saved. Um, I think it's probably all of the above. So one of the, just the, the frog is in the hot water pieces that as, as, as humans and organizations, we're going to have to get out of is we're all in this sort of cobbling mode um, and that's just like our new normal. Um, I think US-based has that like hustle culture where we're not giving ourselves enough time to like, if we're just staring into space, like we feel bad about that. Um, so I think we have to unlearn some of those bad behaviors. We have to get better insights and we have to allow ourselves to actually think about it and converse with our colleagues because the data isn't ever going to come to us with an exact decision on here's the data and precisely what you should do. It needs, it needs nuance and it needs conversation. I'm not sure I answered your question, but no, we're just not in that mode. That's good. I think that's a, it's a question really for, for the entire group. I mean, I think we all can accept that if, if you can spend more time asking questions of the data, you're going to get to better answers, but exactly how you serve that up is I think a really also interesting thing. And I don't think it's universal either. I think different customers are getting different results there. Um, so, so a couple of interesting examples on more successful scenarios. Josh Greenbaum talked about a successful project worked on one that started with the meeting of the stakeholders, line workers on the factory floor, their input and buy-in informed the whole project and the end result had enthusiastic buy-in. It's, is it amazing how like taking your people seriously and involving them like gets a good result? That's and uh, and Timo talks about this raft guide analogy. I'm not going to read it all here, but this notion was that people will voluntarily throw themselves into a risky uncertain situation and yet enjoy it because they feel like an expert is looking after them and that they're supported. And if something goes wrong, they'll be looked after. How can you run your projects that way? Basically, is what it comes down to. Tracy says, on the corporate side, my manager sits up the advisory board, establishes governance, and they agree to the framework before they do anything else. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how you provide a, a path for individuals where they feel like they can grow it, they can grow into new roles as part of this too, you know, that you can individualize a little bit, bit of that too, because I think sometimes it's a stretch to say, we're doing this for the good of the company. I think it's also good to be able to articulate how an individual can grow and change and be part of things, right? Sometimes it's as, as simple as lining someone up with a great mentor that they really admire. You know, there's there's so little of that in a lot of corporate settings now. But I know in my career, I don't know about you, but for me, I think back to some of the amazing mentors I had that I just feel so fortunate. And I think good projects have those kinds of appeal to people. And that's how you get over some of the change stuff, I think. It's like, it's, you know, you meet someone who's like, oh my God, I want to be like you someday. That's That lights a real fire, I think. So anyway. Absolutely. And there's not enough of that. No. What else you got? I'm going to combine um, four and five. Um, okay. And we'll see if I'm any better at doing this. Nope, okay. not. 
L-O-L. Um, so you can't unsilo the people without unsiloing the tech and vice versa, and then architecting um, upstream together. So let me just hit those last two. Um, so for us to really get the, the work done that we need to get uh, done breaking down silos, we cannot do it from a tech perspective or from a human perspective. It has to be together. Even if you can get people to work together uh, better, if they don't have the tech um, platform to support their work. They can't look at the stuff. And if we just do it from a tech perspective, the humans who want the cotton candy on puppies, not all the time, but on some things, like that will never work because the humans are so stubborn about, I got it, I got it. I understand what you're saying, but I need to get this done. So that's why that doesn't work. So, and you, y'all can mock me if you want on this. Um, but one of the things I've seen uh, to be really important is we need to start architecting data together upstream. I'm just going to give one example that no one needs me for today. Everyone could start doing this today. Um, in most B2Bs, um, the inside sales folks will have disqualification reasons. And if you've ever been in Salesforce to see those DQ reasons, they're kind of bananas. And someone, someone made them up somewhere and there's five to 12 drop downs of what those might be. Salespeople will have one loss reasons, very similar. Someone made them up, drop down, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and success will probably have retention churn, same model. None of those will map to each other in any way. None of them will really address the outcomes that we're trying to do from a product perspective. And wouldn't it be nice if that actually, like if even three of those things across the board were, were the same data points, then we could see this beautiful cross-functional thing about, do people care about this thing? Do they think it costs too much? Is there a lot of value? I won't go on too long about that. There are a lot of ways to break down the silos, but one of them has to be that we're architecting better upstream and we'll be cobbling together much less downstream and have whatever system you're in have much more easier to, uh, to understand reports that you can discuss with colleagues. That's usually a longer rant, but it's one mm. I'm excited about. Yeah, that's really appealing to this notion that that you're not just deriving insights from data, but you're having conversations about data, like and and all the things that go into that, right? Like trusting the data, uh, having a, a context for those discussions, and making sense of things and coming up with new ideas. It's it's always really cool to discover some of that. I remember, like ease of use of some of the modern solutions can help at times. I remember. A couple of years ago, looking at a Domo use case where an office manager slash secretary saw the opportunity to build a bunch of like uh, sort of views of data inside her organization and like basically said, I'm doing this and built this for the whole team, you know, and I love that of like just stepping out and embracing that and change basically changed her career and changed her organization. It was a smaller business, but it was really cool. And love it. And and providing the opportunity for that is is really those are the exciting stories. Even if the large scale transformations are not easy to solve, those human stories are kind of what keep me going. Um, we have a couple of really cool comments too. And as we're wrapping towards the last part of our discussion, I'd love to hear kind of you know takeaways people have from this or anything they think we should be looking towards in the future. I've got some cool shows coming up this summer, by the way, but Stay tuned on LinkedIn for that. A couple of the people who are going to be helping me are actually in the chat today, so that's cool. Uh, Brian says, for some people, it's easier to fight change and maintain the false sense of security, nostalgia for old methods, software processes, successful transformations, deal with such obstructionists. And yeah, I mean, there's there's always going to be some people who dig in their heels, and sometimes it's justified. Perhaps sometimes it's not, but that's part of what you have to account for. Uh, Tra Tracy just comments that that people pay their dues for a long time to master certain things. And that could be terrifying when they're not sure what their role is. I think that goes back Less to a lot. Yep. Less duct tape would be amazing. If we could stop non data analysts manipulating Excel reports, we might get a little closer. Oh my gosh. I don't think we can solve spreadsheets today. That's beyond our scope, but yeah, you're so right. People won't change till they understand what's the art of the possible says Brian and what the upside for them will be. Indeed. Okay. What do you think, Marie? Do we cover a lot there? I think we covered a lot. Yeah. There? And yes, hopefully we can, we can all start to influence more the organizations that we work with, but it is, um, 
it is a it is a second law of thermodynamics kind of thing where a closed system can't take on new energy and chaos only ensues. And so we have to redouble our efforts to kind of be that new energy to, to break things up, um, to, to, to let it form a new system. Let's see. I have some more Let's good comments. Neil is reflecting on his first consulting gig. He was perplexed by the size of the staff. He asked his client, what do these people do? They spend morning identifying their friends and enemies in the afternoon, rewarding friends and punishing enemies. Ouch. Resistance to change based on alliances, hierarchies, and power structures. Yeah, and that's the worst of, of the corporate world, right? And some companies, I think, let's face it, are too toxic to fix. Um, but, you know, in my, in my view of the enterprise, like, there's enough companies that do want to get better, and you got to stick with them. But yeah, and not to say that the dynamics Neil discussed don't exist in every company, but I do mm -hmm. think that there are some toxic corporate cultures out there, and there's, you know, nothing. None of our discussions today can fix those. Right. Uh, Timo passes on some incentives, cartoon, and then Catherine. By the way, Catherine, thanks a lot for your calm save. Very insightful. Communities of practice can deepen and sustain enablement at yeah. the human level from data science to end user software. Lots of excellent commentary today. Really smart group of practitioners in the chat. Thanks for making making us a little bit smarter today. Maureen, any any final thoughts you want to share with the group? What's next for you? What where are you what are you doing next with all of this? Um, so I am working with, uh, with organizations that have at least one change agent in, in one of the functional areas who's, who's welcoming us in uh, to try to start this breaking down silos, architecting together upstream um, so that you've got data and insights that every one of the functional areas then has a, a playbook that they can run with and has you know, complete transparency to the other functional areas. And that is exciting work. Thank you, Catherine. Oh, I guess we should talk about feet, the female founder tech conference blues for a sec before we wrap. Um, uh, Tracy, I really like your comment around communities of practice instead of center of excellence. I think I might actually steal that from you uh, completely unabashedly. Sorry about that, but that's really good. Centers of excellence, I like the concept, but it's also it seems a little static. I like communities of practice. That's really interesting. Uh, LinkedIn user, yeah, sorry. I might be able to actually see who you are on LinkedIn, but that's just how it goes. Thanks, glad you were here. So, Maureen, you have vented some spleen on the conference circuit because I've seen it on your LinkedIn posts. And frankly, I don't I don't bl blame you. As you know, I think events are, are broken in any number of ways, but certainly uh, things like a diversity of panel and speaker representation is one of the top ways that events are broken. Do you care to comment a little bit about life as a female founder in the tech industry? Well, it, it, just two things there. If you're not a female founder, you may not know that of, of the VC money that exists in the world today, female founders get two to 3% of it, um, even lower for people of color. Um, and the, on the events side, I can't believe after four, five, 10 years of talking about mannels or diversity um, in events that we're still, you know, that we're still talking about it. Um, and I don't mind, I, I, I love Scott Brinker in many ways, but cannot believe that his recent conference had 21 speakers. Um, four of them were women and I'm, and I'm pretty sure it was 21 white people. There might have been one person who had a little bit of color. Um, but that is just so horribly unacceptable. Um, and 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 still too common. So let's all redouble our efforts to make sure that if we're asked um, to speak somewhere uh, and we're not seeing a lot of diversity, that we point that out, um, just to do what we can to make sure that there is diversity of thought everywhere. Um, Suki, it sounds like you have some comments on this. Uh, absolutely. And and look, I I know some people probably aren't too like psyched that we ended on this topic because it's actually kind of a heavy frustrating topic that we can try to have make fun of it in a way but there's a lot of bitterness and injustice to this let's face it and it makes me angry and um i'm sorry that we have to like end on that note but i just felt it was important because maureen's been talking about that and this issue won't go away and if i if i can comment on one thing too like some of this and i'm not going to make excuses for event planners but i do want to say that 
one of the things that event planners can do to help solve this problem is to stop thinking that they have it all under control and that they know how to run an event. That would be a really good start. It, events are really hard and there's no shame in humbling yourself and taking some time six months, 12 months before a big event and consulting with folks like Maureen and saying, how do we do a better job this time around? What can we do? Who can we contact? How can we get this right? And a lot of it I, I find is that sometimes you just get a little too caught up in that you can put on this great event and do it. And you're great at that. And it's like, well, you're great at the logistics of it, but you're not necessarily very good at creative event design. Enterprise events are broken. Creative event design is a skill and it does not exist inside of your marketing organization today. I'm sorry, it does not. And, and just to give you one example, I was at a show this spring with, with an organization that actually has a pretty impressive uh, diverse leadership team. And I went to their event and, and it was just a bunch of white male dudes on stage. And, and I said to them, I was like, and they, they actually had a couple of female leaders at the event, but they were like booked in other stuff that day. They were, they were on stage the next day. But I was like, the first day is so important, you know, and, and, and all it would have taken was a little bit of planning because they actually have the right people in place, but they didn't have them on stage. And it was just like, those are, these are solvable things. You can consult with experts before your yeah. events that can point these things out to you. And there's no shame in that. We don't all have to be great at everything. Sorry. Uh, okay. I probably offended some people. Okay. But anyway, That's great. Now I'm Good coming time. in hot, I'm giving you a hard time for coming right. in hot, and, and I'm the one coming in hot. Sorry, folks. That's just the nature of it. I'm I'm just this. I, I'm just frustrated because we need we need to reinvent enterprise events, and and vendors have gotten too many excuses for like, oh, it's so great to be together again, and let's give hugs and stuff, and then let's throw up the same non-inclusive homogenous panels and the same boring keynotes and the same stilted over-moderated customer sessions. And like, let's not figure out why people are there, which is peer to peer communication and giving this visibility to a diverse group of constituents instead of pretending like we're diverse. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Thank Suki you. says, and stop putting us on stage. Yeah. For, yeah, of course. Like the tokenization aspect is, is brutal and, um, and awkward as well. Which is why, like I said, when you have the leadership team to back it up, then that's even better. And so then put that on display as well. And if you don't, then just know that your panel is going to be compared to your executive board members on your website. People have web browsers. They look at pictures. Keep in mind. So anyway, and by the way, AI doesn't fix those problems either. So, so your, your responsible AI statements don't get you out of this conversation. I'm happy to hear that preach. Oh, I, I can only, yeah, yeah Suki, I, of course. Yeah, I mean, I've, believe me, I've gotten an earful on many occasions, but I can only begin to understand. But at the same time, you know, I've I've put, I've put had my fair share of abuse and, and received a lot of bullying in my life when I was younger. So I, I feel like I have a little bit of a flavor of some of that. But at the same time, I'm not going to say that it's not different. It is, which is why I brought it out. So here we go. Sorry, folks. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, let's have happy hour. But but no, no. Seriously, let's 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 make things better. What do you say? Let's make things better. Yeah. Sorry. Is that is that okay, Maureen? Sorry. Totally, sorry. totally. I'm happy for everyone to make things better. Okay. You Long don't mind that I like. I hope you don't mind that I derailed. Uh, your... Obviously, since I've been one of the people in your ear about that, right? Yeah. Let's be honest. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to give you the last word. What do you What do you want to say to our gathered viewers? Wow beyond the let's make things better, which is number one, but number two is let's break down some silos. Cool. There you have it, folks. Thanks, Maureen. That was awesome. Thanks, Thanks for, for having that. me. Thanks for all the prep. It's amazing how much prep goes into an unstructured, uh, unscripted <laughs> conversation, isn't it? It's kind of a weird yes. paradox. Thanks all to the fantastic chat. Thanks for bringing it. Much appreciated. Have a great week.